This is episode 75, Fluency Part 1, featuring SLP Steven. Welcome back to another episode of SLP's Wine and Cheese. I'm Maria. I'm Deb. And here's our podcast. It's for the rock and roll, SLP. Woohoo! Rock on! Yeah, shout out to John Miranda. He is the genius behind our intro music. He loves to create original music for podcasters or any media creators. So if you have any interest or need for um music hit him up he yeah. is what's his email we're gonna put it in the show notes okay yeah you know? check out the show notes there we go we're gonna add a lot of cool information in the show notes today mm-hmm. um i like this music i feel like we're we're cool now yeah you know what was the description that you asked him um, when creating our music because i would have been like hey john miranda <laughs> make us a remix period send email like I felt like your words were way more descriptive. Well, so what I said was, oh, where's my, okay. I said, thanks. I said, happy 2020. Wait, where did I write it? It's a nice way to start an email. Like, yeah. Happy New Year is out. So instead you're like, happy 2020 in case you've been messing up writing the date. Right? Right. Yes. And I don't know where the original email is, but what okay. I did ask and, yeah. for was um, I asked him if he could just remix our current song and add some percussion. And then I also said that I'd like it to be reminiscent of Punk Rock Princess from something corporate or by something corporate. Um, and he delivered. I think that was great. That's exactly what I hoped for. I never heard of that song before. I oh, don't it's think so good. I wasn't a punk rock princess. Oh. Clearly. Yeah. Well, you but were just a limited two pit princess. Yes, limited two. <laughs> and I do. And I still like like R and B and hip hop. Yeah. You know, I like little bow wow. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I was I like a him. rocker skater kid. Yes. I had like bracelets and eyeliner. Gotcha. I didn't mm. have that. Yeah. But. Anyway, <laughs> so thank you, John Miranda, and check out the so- show notes if you are interested in having him create some music for you. So today we're going to talk about stuttering because this is part one of a three-part series. We're talking about fluency. We're talking about fluency. I messed that up, but we'll <laughs> talk about that in the interviews. Right, right. And uh, this is our first time really having three a three-part series on fluency mm-hmm. so if you have a lot of clients with fluency this is the episode for you and the next two and the, whoa <laughs> look at that rhyming yeah. action acts yeah so this is the, the trilogy of stuttering yes the trilogy of fluency yes Ooh. the fluency trilogy the fluency trilogy i'm gonna write that down okay we've had another three-part series back in the day about autism mm-hmm. and a lot of people really expressed interest in that so maybe three-part series are just going to be Yeah, it's more cool. I like it. Lots yeah. of people, though, I think from the start of when we started requesting feedback from listeners, mm-hmm. I have heard fluency, 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 please, oh. stuttering, something. So here you are, everyone. Yes, we're delivering. So I had my first fluency client when I was still in uh, clinic at St. John's, our school, mm-hmm. Deb, where we met. Right. Uh, when was your first fluency client? Um, during my first licensed year at an elementary school. First licensed year. Yeah. So So the right after my CF. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so my first client, from what I remember, I mean, it's what, nine and a half years? We talked about this before. Right, yes, nine and a half. Nine and a half years. Um, he was actually, I'm not going to give away any names, you know, obviously. He was a St. John's college student. So he, too, went to St. John's. But he was an undergrad, and uh, he never went to speech before. And I remember our um, our clinic supervisor, Miss Wasan. I'm giving mm-hmm. her a shout out. Yeah, I always liked Miss Wasan. Miss Wasan. 
Um, I remember her like really taking the lead on the session because I was like kind of like a deer in headlights. Like, mm-hmm. what do I do? This is a fluency. And it wasn't like a little kid. You know, it was like someone a couple of years younger than me or maybe even my own age. Right. Yeah. So I felt a little awkward, to be fully honest. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so she was really interviewing him about like how long he stuttered for. And I remember this. She asked him what's his name and his whole like face like just changed. And I didn't know why. I was like, oh, does he not know his name? You know me. I right. Don't know. Yeah. And he w- and he was like, oh, I'm going to stutter on it. And Miss Wissan was like, oh, it's OK if you do. Or she said something like that. And she's like, I would just like you to just try. It. She said this a lot. I remember just try it. <laughs> just try. that was just like, try it. just try it. Mm-hmm. You know, just try it. And then he, like, stuttered, like, a big block on it, too. And I just remember thinking, like, wow, like, it's so hard for him to say his name. And it just made me, like, kind of sad a little. Mm -hmm. And I was like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, you know. Uh And then I was um, thinking, like, wow, like, you know, we've got to take – like sometimes we take advantage some things like, you know, like you asked me my name and I just said it before. Like, hi, my name is this is Maria. Yeah. And it just came out so right, easily. Yeah. But that's not the truth for everybody. You know, yeah. like being asked their name is so scary to them. Right. You know, and, you know, we talk about this on the interview coming up. Um, do you remember like if your client was stuttering on their name? So my client stuttered um, significantly, and he had no strategies. Mm-hmm. He was a young boy, and he um, acquired his disfluency after being hit by a car. Oh, wow. So um, he was very disfluent, but he was also very sweet and very talkative. Mm. It did not impact him whatsoever. Even the kids didn't mind either. Uh, it didn't seem like it was much of a problem except for the fact that he was quite disfluent. Um, so mm. I just wanted, like, without any pressure, just to provide him with strategies so that he can use some fluency shaping techniques so that he can be fluent when he'd like to be. Right. If the need comes. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do remember my supervisor came to watch our session, and I, I don't know if I knew. I never planned sessions around someone coming to see me i'd be like you're coming to see whoever you see right plus nobody's ever on time when they say they're gonna come see you that's kind of a good point so i uh don't think i did this on purpose but yes so she observed his session and we were i was really proud we were just like talking and working on pictured actions nice Um, can't go wrong with the action words that's right right just heard a research study today saying they need like at least like eight exposures in a row or something like that don't quote me on that research Ah. but throwing it in there that it takes longer more exposures for a child to actually understand verbs rather than nouns Uh because nouns i guess are more right because they're just pointed out to everyone all the time too yes but um i do it mostly because it gives you something to talk about Mm -hmm. like what are they doing this is the sentence we're going to practice what are they doing here's the sentence you know they are swimming they are dancing i hear you easy onset melodic intonation Mm -hmm. light articulatory contact just um so we were doing that and then he um was talking to me maybe it was before or after this activity and i remember my supervisor was like stop whoa and i was like uh, like surprised mm-hmm. and then she, i was like oh i just want him to feel comfortable to speak to me and outside of the exercises like he can speak however he'd like if he wants to um, and she was like, I understand what you're saying, but his stutter is too severe and it's never going to get better unless you stop him and make him start over. Mm. Um, so I remember like thinking, OK, and then thinking like, no, I'm not going to do that <laughs> because I don't think that that's the right approach to do to anyone. Mm-hmm. I would never be like, stop it right now. That's right. awful. Do stop it again. Stop <laughs> drinking the wine, Maria. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. so um I just, I, and I mentioned this in part two because Maria did part one with Steven. I did part two with Steven and then we did part three together. So mm-hmm. I did bring up this little anecdote during that um, interview. And I just mentioned saying how like, you know, so don't take what other people say to heart so much. Don't like think you failed just because someone criticized you because like often people are not correct. And Steven agreed with me. 
Go Steve. Bat- <laughs> that's why you're our guest. Because you agree with go us. Go me for just not kidding. being wrong. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, so I just don't think that's. Don't uh, give other people so much credit. Don't discredit yourself just mm-hmm. because someone else says something is wrong. Like, have faith in yourself. You're probably doing the right thing. At the end of the day, I would say, like, in a nutshell, you do know the client more than, like, the supervisor. Right. So, like, remember that, number one. And uh, But I am somewhere in the middle. I've had had clients redo it. But, like, it was only because, like, we've been practicing, like, easy onset, let's say. Um, and then I'm just like, no. Can we do that one more time? But he <laughs> with did it the easy onset. Oh, okay. So then exercises. Yeah. He was just talking about like what he did the night before. Oh yeah, I know or that's like so goosebumps. unnatural. Yeah, yeah. I, was I don't like, like chill. the unnatural. <laughs> yeah, the, when it's too unnatural, it's like sometimes I would like to let them like talk, and then they're just fluent, and then they're, like they're done talking, and I'm like, so today we're gonna talk about <laughs> right. our strategy. So let's really use them today. You know. So I do that. Right. But That's I wasn't even in the stage where he should be generalizing that to his spontaneous mm. speech. I had just got to the school right. and I was quite proud of his ability to describe the pictures fluently. Yeah. Like, so we didn't really get to conversational speech yet. I hear you. Yes. And I know. I'm sure he could have. But at the same time, like, calm down. <laughs> you also they also need to be comfortable with exactly. you, too. And he's opening up to you and giving you this like spontaneous mm-hmm. sample. So like just use that time to listen and assess with what's going on. Like, oh, there's a lot of blocks today. Oh, maybe today we'll do easy onset. Oh, maybe today we'll repeat our breathing. You know, that's how I look mm-hmm. at it. Like, how is this session going to go based off how they're presenting? Right. Yeah. With t- right now. Um, mm-hmm. But that's good that you got a lot of practice with therapy in the beginning, because yeah. for my client at the clinic, I felt like we did a lot of more like education and I didn't get enough experience with like the techniques and the strategies. And right. that I learned all on my own. Mm-hmm. And so anyone listening to this. Hopefully these episodes will help you because we are going to break down assessment and treatment and population yeah. to help you. Did um, you take a uh, Trishon's class? No, I didn't. Oh, I did. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, I took th- it in the grad school. It didn't work out for me. I didn't. Oh. It was the time wasn't good. And I oh. took speech, motor speech instead. So. Oh, I didn't take that. There we go. We needed one or the other. Um, but I remember with that first client I had ever he really liked this. So I was like, oh, this is not a bad session. We just put a DVD on for him. Mm-hmm. And it was all about different people, like a documentary almost, who stutter. Yeah. So that like stayed with me because I'm like, this is kind of, because I was like sitting there like kind of bored. Like, hey, when are we going to do the therapy? Right. <laughs> but yeah. he was super into this DVD. So I'm like, hey, you know what? He's really into right. hearing other people talk about stuttering and facts about stuttering and famous people who stutter. And this right. whole DVD. Just to know that he's not the only one. Yeah. He was so interested in that. So I took that, put that in my back pocket. Mm-hmm. And years later, when I have clients more and more with fluency i incorporate that too so i'm gonna find the ones i like on youtube and i'm gonna add those to the show notes as well nice because youtube has some nice free favorite f i don't recommend true life i stutter uh, i don't think that's on youtube is it it's probably is i think oh. i've watched it on there and um i think just for entertainment value they like Oh, they highlight like all of the things that make life difficult with a mm. fluency disorder um and although that's important and accurate, uh, I don't know if it's like just I've never not even the seen mindset it. you want to put somebody in. Yeah, my the one I f- I'll find the ones the YouTube videos I've used before and the ones that I like recommend. Mm-hmm. So I, pro- I won't we won't add that to the show. Yeah, notes. I wouldn't recommend. That but one. we can't stop people from watching it. So right, yeah, you know if you're curious. But yeah, so we're gonna take a brief commercial break. And then after that, you're going to hear Maria and Steven chatting away. Great clinicians need great scientific research to inform their practice. But how can we know the research with so many articles and so little time? The informed SLP makes it easy. Each month, their team of scientists and clinicians find the research for you. They explain it without the jargon, without the burden, just for SLPs, so you could spend less time reading and more time treating. Visit theinformedslp.com and enter coupon code WINE and CHEESE for 20% off. Check out the show notes for more information. 
And now part one of our fluency segment with Steven Groner, SLP Steven. Hi everyone. So I'm Maria and I am sitting here virtually with the one and only Steven Groner. Say hello. Hello, hello. What's up? It's great to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to have you here. So as of now, it's just Steven and I, and Deb will be back to interview you and hopefully the other ones we could do, all three of us, we could all hang Let's out. Let's do all three. Let's do 10. Whatever yes. you got. Whoever wants to come, just <laughs> come on down. So keeping our show consistent, I am drinking. I have a very nice Castle Rock, that's the brand, mm. wine. It looks really good. It is. It's a Pinot Noir. And I have to give you a little tip as well as our listeners a tip. If you don't know what wine to get, because I was having uh, people over and I was like, what wine do they like? I don't really know them. It's like my boyfriend's side of the family. I'm like, I don't drink. In laws. Uh, right. <laughs> yes. No, they're cool. They're cool. You know, I'm not hating. You just don't uh, know their wine taste exactly. and you want to make a good impression. I do. So what do you do? Steven, you're, you're like reading my mind already. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, well, you know, I'm the wine person now. So I always pick the wine now. And I was like, well, you know what? We have learned on this show that a Pinot Noir is always a good go-to. Mm. And turns out our guests love the wine. And luckily there's one glass left. Good for left. you. Just yeah. one glass left. Yes. Yeah, so that's going to be for you me right now. Out. Well, I uh, do not have any wine at my house right now, mm -hmm. but I do love gin. So I uh, just made myself my favorite drink, a Tom Collins uh, gin, some club soda, um, sugar, and lemon. So basically it's wow. just like a fancy schmancy lemonade but right it does the trick as well i see you have a very nice lemon wedge on the oh yes i don't skimp yeah on the rim yes it's, that just screams class to me so Thank virtual you. Thank cheers you. cheers to you and me you know eating some thanksgiving leftovers i have this uh i think it's an italian kind of cheese Yum. uh dish and it's mat it doesn't doesn't need to be baked it's just uh you know, what is it? Graham cracker, mascarpone cheese, uh, and some blue. Anything milk. with a graham cracker crust is good to me. And wow, it just looks amazing. Totally. Well, I don't have a snack, but hopefully we can snack on some knowledge bites. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Which is even better than <laughs> calories. Mm, I'm not sure about that, but yeah, sure we'll, just, that. we'll just, we'll just go with that. Gotcha. So why don't you just briefly tell us a little bit about yourself? Cause we'll definitely have time to talk more about you, but just quick little description. Nice. Yeah. So I'm Steven Groner. You might know me on Instagram as SLP Steven. Um, I've been a speech pathologist for three years. I graduated from Vanderbilt in Nashville back in 2016. And now I specialize on uh, my love uh, stuttering and fluency disorders. Nice. Yes, because stuttering is a more specific type of fluency disorders. Yes, because we can never forget uh, stuttering's dear cousin, cluttering. Uh, yes. So they are both fluency, fluency disorders, um, but stuttering has received more attention. And it's so near and dear to my heart because uh, I stutter and have since I was a very young boy, but I, thanks to the great help of some incredible speech pathologists, I can speak as fluently as I can now. So uh, that's why I just want to pass it on. Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, SLPs who specialize in stuttering that also stutter themselves. And who better to teach our clients to reduce their stuttering as much as they can yeah. than you who is living the same like you know, life difficulty. Right? yeah well thank you very much because that was one of my biggest fears about mm -hmm. coming into the field was that I wouldn't make a very good speech pathologist because how could I help other people talk well if 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 I couldn't always do it like just then but I think because I know how hard the work is but also how 
how much that it can pay off, I can kind of channel that and give that to, uh, to my, to my clients who stutter. And, you know, even just, you know, all of my clients saying that I have been through speech therapy really, really helps them. So, you know, it has turned out to be a great ride so far. Yeah. So seems like I took that leap. It seems like you're doing very well and I could just hear from your voice and see it on your face that you are very passionate about this topic. So I'm very excited to have you here. Well, I'm psyched to be here. I would love, uh, I would love to, to dig into whatever questions that you have, whatever's, whatever's coming to the surface. I'm ready. Don't worry. I won't be so tough on you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so before we uh, get into our questions, I'm going to just talk about Ash's statement about stuttering, but we will talk about cluttering too. So just for right now, we're going to talk about stuttering. And yeah. they give uh, a brief little uh, description here. It says, talking can be hard if you stutter. You may get stuck on certain words or sound. You may feel tense or uncomfortable. You might change words to avoid stuttering. So it's talking about the different types of disfluencies. Yes, yeah. And the super big thing to keep in mind here is that these these interruptions in your speech are involuntary you they 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 feel like they're out of your control Mm -hmm. um which does not feel good at all think about if you just like stood up to you know walk over to your friend's house and you just tripped oh it's like it's sort of like when you try to like run up a flight of stairs and your toe catches and you trip and you just feel like you're out of control. And like, you know, that, you know, that you're going down and it's, it's like really, really scary. It's like, it's like doing that every three to five words whenever you talk for your whole life. So it's like, it's really not fun. Um, But thankfully there are ways that we can gain a bit more control over it. um, So, so, so that we don't trip as much. Exactly. I've had a couple of clients like, and I've had a lot of um, teenage clients and we'll get to talk about treatment later, but oh, yeah. one of them was just like, it's annoying. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. yeah that's a great word. You know, that's your words. I'm not going to call it annoying, but you know, <laughs> no, go ahead. It sure yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. Let's talk about, let's say that. All right. Stuttering can feel annoying. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Very much so. Okay. And I'm sure that it, and I'm sure that it will for me on this podcast but i know some things that i can do uh and i'm in a good place to be able to face them so yes not 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 to worry don't worry don't worry be happy (laughs) so amen sister yes so some type of um symptoms or characteristics i shall say of stuttering would be like interjections like um like but there's also a typical amount that we use as individuals. So, oh yeah. So right? yeah. So there are there are many different kinds of disfluencies or uh, things that kind of pepper our, pepper our speech that get in the way of the smooth forward flow of our message. So some of them are categorized as stuttering like disfluencies, and those are the r r r r repetitions they're the prolongations the Mm -hmm. blocks those are what we think of as stuttering but then we also have non non non-stuttering like or uh more typical or normal disfluencies um um or like i just had um or like are our interjections we can have whole phrase whole phrase whole phrase rep rep repetitions uh or we can have revisions where we start to then we change it to something else but actually i want to go back and change my thoughts so all of those things get in the way of the fluent forward flow of our speech um, but only some of them are um characteristic of stuttering right and when you're assessing a client that's what we really want to focus on today let's do it in your assessment I think it's important to write which um, which characteristics they had and provide examples. Are are there some speech pathologists who don't do that? I don't know. 
Well, but I, no. we got, you never, you can't assume anything, right? You can't <laughs> assume true. anything in life. Well, you're right. You know, it, uh, right? <laughs> it does take more time to listen carefully or to record and then go back and actually like categorize what the type of disfluencies were. Um, it's much, much simpler and much faster to just keep like a running tally of the number of disfluencies, but the, the type of disfluencies can tell you a lot as well. So I always make sure that I, in, that I include them. Um, but I'm not going to judge anyone who doesn't. It's just you, you just miss out on, uh, on what can be some really valuable data. I um, agree. Can we get so a cheers to that? Cheers to that. Cheers valuable to that. data. Valuable data. Oh, we're <laughs> cheersing on valuable data. I, can't, I gotta say this is a first for me. <laughs> Same here. Who would have thought one day I'd be cheersing to valuable data? <laughs> here we are, though. Well, that's what happens when you get it when you get into this field, right? Exactly. So for sure, we agree about that. So when you have a client come in, so let's kind of talk sure. about the evaluation process. Yeah. So we yeah. get a client coming in could be any age really, um, specifically let's say a school age, right? They start to come, yeah. they're maybe four, five, six, sure. six whatever it is. They're noticing it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and then we're doing an informal language, spontaneous language sample. Do you sure. Know, like that's helpful? Oh yeah, so I mean, of course, um, in any fluency uh, evaluation, you should also do a, language screen, an art, an, an, art, an, art, an articulation screen, and a voice screen. Um, so yeah, so normally whenever I get a new client, I start off just trying to get a disfluency count in as many different contexts as I can. And that, that starts with baseline convert conversation. So when I first pick them up, I um, and when I first have uh, my pen and paper, I just start to keep track of um, all, all of the words that, that, that they say fluently. And then for each word that they say disfluently, I mark down what kind of disfluency it, it was. And so we always start off in baseline conversation, but um, I also like to move in to play if they're younger yes. um, or... Um, talking with their mom or dad or with their sibling if they came with them, um, doing some reading if they could read, um, yeah. retelling a story, which is a very, very complex task um, to see, you know, just trying to see, trying to, trying to get them to talk with as many different people about as many different things as I can so that I can get what is a truly valid sample of their fluency. Um, so that's kind of first and foremost. There are, there are two main pillars that I always have to capture whenever I do a fluency assessment, and that's I have to, uh, I have to learn about their fluency, and I have to learn about their feelings. So fluency and feelings, those are the big ones. If you learn nothing else. You just have to capture those in some way. And there are lots of ways to, to do that. So um, yes, I always love to start with a really, really solid disfluency count um, in as many different contexts as I can. And then I need to find out what their feelings are towards their speech, because there is a wide spectrum of how we feel towards our stuttering. And on one end, there can be no uh, awareness that they even stutter. And that's, it's tough to do therapy at that point, because if they don't, if they don't think that, that, uh, that anything is wrong, um, then why would they put in all of the hard work that we're going to ask them to do, right? Or there's the, there's the opposite end where like stuttering is the worst thing in their life and their life is so bad because they stutter and they they don't want to talk they don't want to speak up it keeps them from doing life you know life's tasks um and it just really really Im 
impacts their view of themselves. So in some way, I have to see where they fall on that line because that's going to help to in, to inform how I how I treat them. Um, and so what I like to use, uh, I'll use either the CAT, which is the C communication attitude test and they, they have one for school age kids which is the cat they have one for preschool age kids which is called the kitty cat and then they have one for adults which is called the big cat wow i know right so i i'll use that one uh and it's uh, it's just a list of yes or no questions like um is it hard for you to say your name do you sound like like most of the other kids uh does your mom worry about how you talk whatever whatever and they say yes or no and then you get a you get a score of 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 how many questions that they answered that point to them having some kind of negative speech attitude um of course i i uh will use the oasis if i have more time so that's the overall assessment of the speaker's experience of stuttering uh, and they have one for uh, each type of age group it's just about four or five pages long and that one's really long so you get some some really good scores you just have to have the the time to give it and if you're saying well Steven this is great but I don't have funds to get all these cool tests right. like I'm just trying to fly by the by the seat of my pants you can always use a 10 point scale self rating so um, if I don't have time or if I don't have my test with me, which is never, um, but you can always ask these two things. You can say, um, how, so, well, based on the age, you, you, based on the client's age, you might have to word it sort of differently, but you can ask about how severe they think that their speech is, that their stuttering is. So I'll say on a scale from one from uh, from one to ten, how severe is your stuttering? Uh, with one being um, no stuttering, two being extremely mild stuttering and 10 being extremely severe stuttering um and so i see kind of where they where they rate themselves on that and then i ask well how satisfied are you with your with your speaking abilities on that same scale from one to ten with one being not satisfied at all and 10 being perfectly satisfied and just with those two questions, I can start to, in a very quick and rough way, but still in a very useful way, I can get at how bad that they think that their stuttering is and how dissatisfied that they are with their speech. And Yeri and Ambrose, I believe it was in 2005 or 2007, found that a jump or movement of two or more points on a 10-point scale is a clinically meaningful change so wow. if, if they come in and say i'm two out of ten satisfied with my speech and by the end of you know therapy they're at a six that has been a a clinically meaningful jump in their speech status in their speech satisfaction so that's kind of the kind of rough and dirty way that i use but it, it can still be really really helpful that's awesome because I like that the two points, they jump from where they start, right? So you're no. not always aiming for that 10. I mean, you no. are. You are I mean, yeah, 10, but, but you, don't, you don't have to start at that 10. You can start at a four, and then you can right. move to a six, and then an eight, and then a 10. Exactly, and they might not get to a 10 in a year or two. You know, they might need five years in therapy. Sure. They might need that, yeah. you know, sometime. They might need 10 years. Clients take some time yeah. off, and then they come back. Do you yeah. see that a lot? Yes, and then you have well, to... Well, yeah, I mean, that was... that was. Yeah, yeah, I know, seriously. Can't you just stay in therapy? Uh, no, I mean, but that was true of me as well. I mean, even though I got my... So I went to a, to a two-week-long intensive fluency shaping uh, program when I was 17, and, but it still took me until I was 23, so six years, for me to be able to say hi, I'm Steven and I stutter. Like, even though I had had really good therapy, um, it, 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 
it, I mean, it was still hard for me to admit it. So I still had more work to do. And that just takes time. Wow. Yeah. It just takes time. That's yeah. a second that. So a lot of, um, so you gave us a lot of information there. So I just wanted to recap. I think a good way for people to remember is the two F's, right? Fluency yeah. and feeling. Fluency, uh, yeah. If you have those, then you've done your job. Yes. This is making me feel good about my assessment tips, nice. my assessment skills, because I do agree and I also do the same thing that you want to get the conversational sample and with mm -hmm. multiple t uh, tests, right? So, yeah. and also when you're having them, I like how you have them retell a story because that is very difficult. That's, I mean, that's, that's hard for like me to do. You yeah, know? also that's hard for you know, adults. A kid who's eight, right? Exactly. So that, so that is going to really stress their speech system. And so you might see actually more stuttering come out in a task like that. And also that works as a good language screening assessment. Yes, exactly. Hey, hey. And, tick, and boy, really everything. Right, all of it. Yeah. That. So, and I like that you mentioned that you do an articulation screen also. And then if you feel like there are a lot of articulation issues, you can delve deeper into that by doing a formal maybe later on. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, they're there for fluency. You can definitely focus on that. Yeah. You could have, you know, that yeah. articulation yeah. on the radar too. Because maybe there are certain sounds that they're not pronouncing also you, clearly. Uh, and then there's And that can make it even too. harder for exactly for them to be understood. Yeah. Huge. Exactly. Huge. So, yeah, because they're both speech disorders, right? The <laughs> articulation oh, yeah. and yeah. the fluency. Fluency, yeah. yeah. So you got to remember that too. So that I felt like was a lot of information. Thank you. Of course. I have a lot of um, parents that ask stuff like, uh, so why does my child stutter? Mm. So <laughs> well, let's talk about the well. etiology. <laughs> okay. So Is it bringing you back to grad school where you had to like memorize all the theories. And I'm like, they all sound good. They all sound they all good. Sound, they, they all sound good and we're still not sure. Exactly. So this, yes, so that's this what is, I tell parents. I'm like, this well, is what I say. For sure. Right, exactly. Which stinks because, of course, we want to know and we want to be able to, you know, tell them why. But so this is our best guess currently. So first I say, look, speech is hard. It is the most complicated and complex motor or movement task that we do. Um, it is more challenging than catching a uh, touchdown in the NFL. Uh, it's it, it's it is so hard because it to, requires a lot of fine muscle exactly a right lot exactly of muscles, we, so you got to look at that too because right like, so you know, it's what? so hard you know? right but but gotta, we don't we don't we don't really we don't really think about it being hard because to most of us it's 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 automatic so while we don't know exactly why children stutter we do know that it's re related to their genes uh, and that, uh, that, that they can have genes that code for a, a weaker speech system. Um, and so and when that- parents, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. No, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. parents that, and they're like, but no one stutters. And like, they don't have to stutter. Like, you know, and then parents come back to me like weeks, like, you know, my cousin. Actually- How did I think about it? I'm like, Meredith. <laughs> right? <laughs> Exactly. Well, and I you do know, mention that it is genetic. It is. It is. And in fact, that is like the top risk factor yes. uh, for stuttering is having a, a family history of stuttering. Um, so that's huge. So then when that, when that weaker speech system goes to try to do the, the incredibly complex task of speech, um, then it just can't do it as well, and that can lead to some stuttering. So in, in the case of those of us who stutter, we think that, that their speech system weakness um, centers around their 
rhythm and timing abilities. So there's a place in our brains called the premotor cortex where we plan out what, what we want to say and put our thoughts into words. Uh, and then those words get chunked into syllables. So if you, if you think of those syllables as cars stopped at a red light, right? Uh, that, that's kind of the first step. Then there's another step in our brain called the called the called the supplementary motor area and that's where we sequence those um syllables so they all come out in the right order okay so we have all these cars at this stoplight and they're in the right order and then there's a third place in our in our brains called the basal ganglia uh, and that acts as a timer or a stoplight that gates basically when those syllables or cars can go through that light um, and go down to our mouths to be spoken. Um, and then there's a fourth place in our brain called our, our, um, our auditory cortex, um, which gets um, which gets auditory feedback on on what we're saying so that we can change and adjust things um, to get things right. So we can think of him as a police officer who's watching the intersection. So whenever we stutter, all those cars, think of them getting the green light to go and they all start to go and then it just slams red and they slam on their brakes and then it turns green again and they, and they start to go and then it turns red again and then it turns yellow and they slow down. It's because there's, there is something about this circuit um, through our basal ganglia, it seems, that just misfires this, this critical timing um, and makes it so that when we go to say our syllables, they 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 don't always come out when they need to um, and come out fluently. So, as you, if you were a driver in one of those cars and you knew that this stoplight that that this that your um, basal ganglia would do a poor job at getting you through that light you might and you knew that it was going to be stop and go and touch and go and you might you might hit a few cars and it was going to take a long time you might get tense you might grip that you know steering wheel tighter you might start to honk more exactly and so then we sort of learn oh this is hard Things don't flow like they should for some reason. We don't know why this why this stoplight has just stopped working, but it has. And then that can make it even worse. So we're we're all tense. We're mad. There's road rage, and that and that just makes the feelings um, exactly w exactly the other s there exactly. So that was that was very long and sort of that in depth. Good. But that's that's how I like to kind of set it up and kind of like picture it. That's. that's the Great. best that we know as to why, you know, why we stutter. Yeah. If, and I, I like that you use that analogy with the cars because that's something kids can understand. Right. And the, they love cars. Because parents, you know, maybe, you know, it depends. Like if the parent really wants to know more and some parents are just kind of like, you just, you just do it, you know, but like just if like you're fix asking it. me. Yeah. Right. And then right. this is a simple way that maybe won't overwhelm them so much. So yeah, I exactly. Yeah. A parent would be happy to hear that explanation as yeah. well as, as so. I did as well. <laughs> right. So it's a miscoordination really. And the, the rhythm and the timing between the brain and then the muscles. So somewhere, exactly. that's kind so of what I know, saw. Somewhere yeah. there's a breakdown. We know, exactly. We, we know what we want to say and we have the, the physical, uh, uh, ability to say them, but we but we just don't say our 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 uh, words and syllables at the right time. They get stuck, and and that's 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 what we hear when when we hear the symptoms of stuttering, as you hear in my own speech. You know, as we talk talk now. Right. Yeah. I um have a lot of parents, or even children that want to always like ask me like, but why, why do I stutter? You know, and there's not really a concrete answer. So there's and also that hard. aspect too, that I think is important for you to teach 
I mean, we'll talk later on about therapy, but as, but acceptance too, you know, yeah. this is it, this, this is it, you know, this is the cards I've been, we've been dealt. Yeah. After, been dealt. True. After a certain age, we can say with much more certainty that, that it is unlikely that their stuttering will fully resolve. Um, so, I mean, up, up to age like seven or eight, even um, you can even, I mean, really, really in my own practice, I've seen kids up to age 12, even like fully recover from stuttering, but past age, age 12, it is, it is hugely unlikely that they will. And even once you get into like school age, like age, like seven, your chance of fully recovering goes way, way down. Although I, I've seen it and think that it, that it that it's still possible. Yeah, there's so many variables too. So so many variables. Well, since we're talking about assessment, I was just wondering. Um, for me, I usually I definitely start with that um, spontaneous conversation, make them feel comfortable, establish rapport, and I like to go over that personal information because you know we've got to ask that anyway, really. Yeah, name. I do personally ask them their name. Yeah, I mean, and they... So what is that? Is that a bad thing that I do? Is it like, put, am I putting them on the spot too much? But I do just want to know if they are able to say their name. Because exactly. I've had clients that stutter, but they didn't stutter on their name. And I was like, whoa. And then I had one that I remember distinctly was like, so I don't want to say it because it's Say it because he knows like, that he's going to stutter. I know, that's why I asked you. I, I know. know. I so it is, I it is not... Real. It is not real with the clients. <laughs> it is not a mean thing because they will be asked throughout their whole lives what their name and what their birthday is. You just and made so, me feel so much better. Thanks right. So if it's hard happen. for them, then then you have to know so that you can help them. In fact, that those the name and date of birth are my uh, are always my very first therapy stimuli okay so, thank you Stephen. Right, i mean Steven. seriously it's That's like, like we will be asked that every week until the days and you know until yes. the day that we die so, How functional is that? Exactly. Yeah, oh my gosh, Until yeah. the day that we die, you're in the nursing home. That's what the first and, thing they right, ask And they right. still come ask you. Right. You, you will that. never escape these questions. <laughs> no. You no. cannot, you can run, but you cannot hide. You can run, but you cannot hide. Exactly. So you, you use that as well. All right. Phew. All right. I don't feel so guilty right now. <laughs> Good. What age would you recommend diagnosing stuttering in children? I know that's a hard question. I don't never so really I know the exact age, you know, so not I I don't go by age. Right. Age can be yes. a bit misleading. I go by time since stuttering onset. Because you can have a kid who's two start to stutter, or you, you can have a kid who's five start start to stutter. And so it's not as much about their age. It's about how long that they've been stuttering. So yes. if you have been stuttering for more than 12 months, um, then you, you, yes, you can, and uh, you can and should be diagnosed with stuttering and you should start treatment. Um, especially if the stuttering hasn't started to go down or decrease. You, you can even, that diagnose and um, and pick up for therapy a child who has been stuttering for six or more months if they have a lot of tension and secondary behaviors um, and if they have uh, any kind of a strong um, negative attitude towards their speech. So if they have one of those two two things and they've been stuttering for at least six months, then I would also say pick them up and start therapy. But if you're within the first six months after the start of stuttering, then I go by the kind of wait and see approach and see if they will uh, or if it will resolve on its own. So after 12 months, um, that's, when I di that's when I diagnose or after six months, if they have a lot of tension or um, any negative speech attitudes. Right. And that can be at age three, that can be at age five, that can be at age seven, that yeah. can be at age, well, yeah. 
37, like if you have a stroke or something, then I would, you know, that, that, then I would diagnose it um, whenever I first, first saw them. Uh, but, but that's a bit different because it's, because it's, it's neurogenic stuttering. Right. It's acquired. Acquired. Yes. So you actually uh, wanted to tell us a little bit about some stuff that you are working on, right? For cluttering and um, you even have yeah, so, so, some surprise here. I'll let you announce it for our listeners. Well, I would. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, I think I have, I think I have some things that I uh, that that might be almost as good as cheese and wine. Right. Um, so I, um, I sell a package called Fluency School, the, the ultimate how to treat stuttering package where I give you everything that you need to treat, to treat stuttering like a boss. And um, I, because like I love you guys boss. and I, and I like a boss, right? With that, with that hashtag. Um, so if you use the promo code wine and cheese rocks and it does um at at slpsteven.com you can get that for 25 percent off and that will also stay in effect when i drop my fluency school volume two the the ultimate how to treat cluttering package uh which should be out at the turn of the new year so cluttering is a fluency disorder like stuttering but it is characterized by a a rapid rate or speed of speech um as well as um any odd um stress or or speech rhythm, um, a lot of non-stuttering like disfluencies. So the ums and errs, the likes, the phrase repetitions and the, and the revisions, um, and a lot of tele, te, or a lot of telescoping or co-articulating of sounds in syllables. So it does not get talked about as much as stuttering, um, but uh, it's been it's thought that about a third of people who stutter also clutter. So I think that that it's huge, and that we should uh, that that we should fight it. So that's going to come out next. But wine and cheese rocks will get you twenty five percent off. Of All capitals. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we'll include that in the show notes too. So, so you're also just, on Instagram, right? At, yes, I am. You can find me at, at slp.steven. Yes. And I just finished my gin. So Look at that. We're actually timing. right in time too, which is good. Um, perfect. Look at that. You, yeah, you do have good timing. So, Thank you. Yes, I don't I'm very to hear that you, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You know, I've sort of made up for it. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah. you took it out on the drinking. Exactly. <laughs> hey, you take it out on something. Why there you not go. Some gin. There you I go. I actually had my first gin cocktail that I enjoyed at that. Yes. Not, at, not, not in the convention center outside. But of <laughs> during that trip. trip. Well, I'm glad that you found one that you like. See that tie in there? Hey yo. So this was awesome. I really loved yeah, all the great it sure investment was. uh tips or protocol that you gave us. Tips, tricks, and I really yeah. liked that you talked about the two Fs, the feelings, because that I think is one thing that you, and see, as and see a, you did not or I didn't feel like we got enough training in. No, and the no more does, really. I start to work with these clients, the more I see how both equally important they yeah, are it's both not even sometimes mm -hmm. more the feelings yeah yeah you know? yeah and and it's it's different for every client but yes. you just you just have to have it's like having two reins in your hand when you're on the horse right yes. you, have have, you, you have to have both of them so that you can steer if you just have one you're just going to kind of go in circles so you have to have fluency and feelings knowledge if you want to help us yeah. Awesome. And that was can. great. Yeah. And you can, right. With your packet. So <laughs> I think that's a great analogy, but we, which I can totally quote you on that. So you could have that as your quote or you could pick <laughs> another quote. So, I mean, I, I enjoyed that too. So um, you. A, is it a quote of mine or like a quote that I like? Either like one. From someone you, could, you could self quote. 
or oh. pick another one that you have heard and liked and I'll okay all right I have um I have two yeah yeah so I I like to say fluent feels good at least for me like being fluent feels good and that kind of hits at at kind of both of those pieces, you know, fluency and feelings. I have found that all of the work that I've put into my speech has been worth it and that it helps me to feel good to be able to talk fluently. So fluent feels good is something that, that, that I like to say um, and that is true for me. Um, I, it's funny because I don't, I don't know who said this, but um, I love this quote that's, if you cannot do great things, do small things in a great way. Wow. And sometimes it, it is felt like I can't do great things because I can't always speak fluently. Um, but I can do all the, all the small things. I can be nice to a, to a friend. I can pet a lost dog. I can help, you know, someone cross the street, whatever it is, even if we feel like we don't have what it what it takes to to do everything that we want to or that we dream we can always do something small right now in a truly great way and that has a lot of meaning so i'll leave you with those two those are i don't know what better way to per end that this interview with that so i'm going to just say cheers <laughs> and good night and steven will be back good night good night i'll see good you night. then That's our show, everyone. Thanks for listening to SLP's Wine and Cheese. We have new episodes every week, so be sure to subscribe. Also, we'd appreciate it if you would like and review us on iTunes. If you love the show and want more bonus content, check us out at patreon.com slash SLP's Wine and Cheese.